so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. After 34 years in the police and 25 in homicide, it was former Detective Inspector Gary Jubilin's job to catch killers. He has worked on some of the biggest criminal cases in Australia, including the Lint Cafe siege, the gruesome murder of drug dealer Terry Falconer, a crime that was later brought to life in the series Underbelly, the murders of three Aboriginal children in Bowerville in the 90s, and the death of Matthew Levison in 2007. But it was the case of William Tyrrell, the three-year-old in a Spider-Man suit who vanished from his foster grandmother's backyard in Kendall, New South Wales, that would cost Gary his career. In 2020, he was convicted for illegally recording four conversations with a person of interest in that investigation. I'm not getting the truth from you, and that causes me concern. Whether it was an accident or whether it was just, just brain snap for a moment, We can resolve this. Overnight, he was taken off a case he'd spent four years searching for answers on. And now, many in his old career refuse to associate with him. If I'm that bad, send me to jail. Why should I pay a fine for doing police work? So, you know, some people say that's dumb. I I would have to agree if I'm looking from the outside. But from my perspective, I think that was the uh, the right way to, uh, to deal with it. So instead, He's been befriending criminals who've done their time. Hardened ones. The ones he used to be tasked with locking up. He wants to understand badness from the other side. To unpack what makes a human do evil things. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. But this month, instead of deep diving into one criminal case each episode, we've been looking behind the crime, talking with people who actually work behind the scenes, from a criminal psychologist to a psychic investigator. And today... We're talking to Gary Jubilin about the life of a homicide detective. Gary, was the job of a homicide detective what you thought it was going to be? I didn't know what I was going to do when I joined the police. And then, uh, you know, I started working in uniform and I was interested in detectives. And what sort of drew me to it was a crime scene. I think it was a murder where I saw detectives go behind the tape. I was out protecting the crime scene. And I thought, I wish I was the person going behind the tape and seeing what's there. And then uh, I remember early in my career, some homicide detectives turned up at the police station and they were like mythical creatures. Because <laughs> they uh, don't have uniforms on. No, no, no. And they're a homicide detective. I'm thinking, I wouldn't mind a piece of that. And when I investigated my first homicide, I was a local area detective, but I was hooked on it. Like, if you're going to be a detective, I can't think of a better thing to uh, throw yourself into For those unaware of the world, what is the job of a homicide detective in terms of like how it happens? Because the general duties cops will usually arrive on a scene. When do you get called in and are you redirected from something else? How does that work? Yeah, okay. For a homicide detective, let's say a body has been found and that's generally how the investigation starts. A body might be found dumped in bushland. Local police will be called to it. They'll be uniformed police. They'll call the local detectives out. The local detectives will look at it if it looks like there's something sinister in what's happened. They'll call detectives. Depending on the, the nature of the crime, will dictate whether homicide run the investigation or whether they just oversee the work that the local detectives are doing. I see. Then it's broken down and homicide's allocated the case and then you take the case over. So do you have set hours? It's not a nine to five. <laughs> No, it's definitely not a nine to five. And I think probably some people criticise me that I was too passionate about the job, but uh, definitely homicide detective, you're not nine to five and you have to be prepared to bleed for the job. And that sounds dramatic, but it's going to impact on your life. And if you're not prepared to make that sacrifice, there's plenty of other areas you can work within the police. But when you're tasked with finding out what happened to uh, someone, why someone's life was taken, it's not nine to five. And when you are put onto a case, 
Do you live and breathe that 24-7 or do you have other cases on the go or you're just focused on the one? It's funny, in my career, I tell people I worked on this case for 10 years and then another one for 15 and years. You and you think it's the whole time. And people go, well, <laughs> you know, how, how old are you? 120, you've been doing it. You juggle things. So right. at any one time, I might be focused on one specific case, but I might also be having three other cases on my books. So you're juggling and you're also on call as a homicide detective. So in New South Wales and other states, it's a similar situation that when you're on call that week, you're on call. If something happens, like a body's found or there's a murder, you get called out to that. So you've got to drop what you're doing and then focus on that case. So there's a bit of a juggling act and there's always, you know, arguments for resources and trying to push resources here where you need them there, but it's a balancing act. I know that sounds like a bizarre question, but I actually didn't know that, <laughs> that yeah. you would be juggling. I thought it was like you were living and breathing because that's what the TV shows makes it sound yeah. like you do, that you yeah. literally live and breathe one case. Oh, you do. And quite often you might have two cases really ramping up at the same time mm-hmm. and then you're really juggling. You know, <laughs> it's uh, not unusual to have cases just running along where you've just got to balance it out. My next question is something that's often only given to women, this question, yeah. but I know that you had a young family while yep. you were juggling this job. You had two young kids. How did you juggle that? You miss out on things. Like I missed out on my son's fifth birthday because we we're extraditing someone back from Queensland over a murder. My kids who are now adults, I thought I shielded them from my uh, world that I operated in and they can recite different phone calls I've had at two o'clock in the morning when no I way. thought I was being discreet and they're going, <laughs> you know that time you were on the phone and they found that head, what happened there and stuff like that. You try to shield your kids from it. So it impacted, but I really tried to balance it as, as much as possible. And uh, when I left the police, my kids said something very nice. I have a boy and a girl and they're adults now, but they said that they knew they lost a bit of their father to this job, but they also knew that People needed me more than they needed me at that time. And I'm thinking that's pretty cool and wise coming from your own kids. So, Especially because they would have been so young, so it would have, when it all started, so it would have been hard for them to compartmentalise that. But obviously, like, as they've gotten older, they've come to terms with, yeah, no. And and, and not just your kids, your partner, family, friends and all that. And I make a joke of it, but I'm only half joking. Since I've left the police, I've had a list of people I had to go around and (laughs) apologise to (laughs) because the only reason I was able to throw myself in 100% is that they let me. Yeah, they gave me time to do that. And then they would still be there for me when I came back to put the pieces back together again. So, yeah, you needed that support network. Because a lot of the crimes that you've been involved in, like William Tyrrell and like Bowerville, yeah. they're not here where you live. Yeah. So you have to relocate for a time, don't you? Yeah, and that's uh, when you're on call or you've got a job and it depends where the job is and you might be living in a small country town for the next three or four months. You just don't know. And like William Tyrrell up the north coast, Bowerville, I was up the north coast. Another one, Terry Falcon, I was up the north coast. I was fortunate in that I had family up there and... Uh, and my uh, parents used to think, oh, I'm a great son because I'd always call it and visit. That's because they lived up in that area. But if I was doing a murder somewhere else, they wouldn't have seen me. But anyway, things balance out. But you do make sacrifices, but it is also so rewarding, the work that you do. And uh, you don't see it as a sacrifice. You've put your hand up. You're not a conscript. Like You don't get marched in and say, you've got to work homicide. <laughs> That's what I wanted to do. So it was a price that I was prepared to pay. And like we said, it's all about those victims. Once you meet those families, those parents, those yeah. you know brothers and sisters. That's driven me throughout the whole of my career and it's sort of defined me. It's made it very clear who I'm working for and I'm working for the families of these victims. Hmm. And uh, that may have alienated me in my own organisation, but uh, I would always do what's right. When you do attend, and I've spoken to a lot of retired homicide detectives and homicide detectives that I respect, And I think it's general and it might be in different words, but I always said to a family, I will do everything humanly possible when I took over the investigation. I wouldn't promise that I could solve it because if you promise something that you can't deliver, that can come back to cause them more pain. But giving the family comfort that you are going at it 100% and giving your all makes so much difference to them. Since I've left the police, families have reached out to me and uh, their frustrations where they think police aren't going as hard as they should, that adds to the trauma. Mm. Bowerville was a classic example of it. When I first became involved in that investigation, I think it was seven years after the three kids were murdered, 
they said that no one cared. And uh, that, I can tell you, added greatly to their trauma. You explain in your book that people get hurt in murder investigations and that's because it's your job to go hard, yep. to push hard. Yep. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah. When you investigate a uh, homicide, you've got to ask the hard questions. You've got to do the hard things. And I'm talking generally here. Mm. When you're looking at a homicide, you look at the people close to the victim. We do victimology, see who they associate with, and invariably you might find someone that's involved in the murder. So when you're dealing with, let's say, and I'll just pluck this out of the air, if you're dealing with a lady that's been killed, you might interview the husband. Now, the husband might be genuinely a grieving husband that's lost his wife in tragic circumstances, but you've got to go hard at that person to satisfy yourself that he wasn't involved in it. So when I say you go hard, if someone's been murdered, we lift the lid on everything. Mm, so you ruffle we, feathers. We stir mm. things up. I always do it with proper perspective. But you come across things, the deeper you look and you come across things and, you know, sometimes people do get hurt. But I carried something and I, when I'm speaking to junior detectives, it helped me a great deal. It was a situation where a uh, lady was killed and I had reason to think that the husband may or may not have been involved. So I had to go pretty hard at him in an interview and I went hard at him and it wasn't pretty. Mm -hmm. And after it... I apologised to him because we found out that he wasn't involved and I apologised to him and he said, Gary, I was so happy you were going hard at me because I knew you were the right person to be on the investigation that you were going to do everything that you said you would do. And so that gave me a lot of comfort. So sometimes when I go hard at people and it plays out, I explain to them that now allows me to move on to the next person I'm looking at. So, yeah, it's a price you pay, but if you're going to call yourself a homicide detective, you're not going to keep everyone happy. No. <laughs> yeah. I want to talk later about how your perception of badness has changed. Yeah. But to start with, when you were in the cops, how did you see good guy, bad guy? Was it very linear? Yeah, I looked at the world pretty black and white. I have empathy and I hear a lot of experienced cops saying, you know, what makes a good cop? Empathy. And it, it is important. But when you're tasked with investigating a crime, you're chasing the bad guy. You solve that crime or you take it as far as you can and then you move on to the next one. So once I've charged someone, I wasn't thinking, why did that person commit this crime? Mm -hmm. What's happened to him after or her after the crime? When I left the police, it gave me an opportunity to sit down and talk to people that, you know, I've been speaking to some notorious crooks and it's, I'm not looking through the lens of a detective. I'm just saying, okay, what happened here? How did that occur? And that sort of opened my eyes to some of the things that people, you know, experience in their younger life and how it translated to um, the crimes that they committed. One person that features heavily in the book is Bernie Matthews and, uh, those that don't know Bernie Matthews, he was an armed robber, escapee, one of New South Wales' most notorious criminals and probably had a reputation across the country. He also, at one stage, tried to kill a prison warder by biting his throat out. Now, sadly, Bernie's passed away, but I became very close to him and we became good friends after I left the police. A mutual person that we knew put us in contact with each other and we sort of, OK, what are we going to talk about? But... I got to understand a lot about badness through Bernie and some of the violence that he experienced in his early years and also in the prison system when it was fairly, uh, well, there's no other way of putting it in graft and like prisoners were brutalised mm. and violence bred violence in that regard. So he's not making an excuse and corrective services have certainly uh, learnt from it and uh, it changed their ways. But you could almost, if I was treated that way, I'd become pretty angry and I'd become bad. So that made me look at crime a little bit differently. Okay, why has this person got to there? Because as a homicide detective, I only saw it at the end. Mm. And you also see, you know, what that person might have done, the very, very bad. So it's easy to put them in that box. Yeah. It was funny sitting down with Bernie because I was in the armed hold-up squad and those were in the days where, you know, people were robbing banks all the time and it mm -hmm. was you know, cops and robbers, literally, and people would get shot and Bernie and I joked about what would have happened uh, if we came across each other because I'm sure guns would have been drawn when he was working and I was working. But, yeah, it's interesting. So it's been an interesting journey speaking to people and understanding a little bit more about what is badness and trying to put our finger on it. 
With the book badness, I think it was important at the start of the book that we talked about Michelle Pogmore Mm -hmm. because I think the focus when you're looking at badness, you need to know the impact it has. And uh, Michelle was a 13-year-old girl who was murdered and her body was just dumped at Mount Druitt. I responded to that job. That was one of the jobs I got called out for as an on-call response. I didn't run it, but the initial uh, part of it. And that murder is still unsolved to this day. It's almost 20 years later. Kathy Nolan, her mother, would stay in contact with me throughout her career, which is not unusual in a situation. I mean, I was the person that informed Kathy that Michelle had been murdered. And I went to see her after I left the police and it broke my heart. She's still got the room set up mm. for like 20 birds and on there like for a 13-year-old girl and she just can't bring herself to close the room down. Now, that, I think, you know, everyone thinks about that and how do you deal with it and uh, the pain. So... Starting to write about crime, I don't want to glorify crime in any way. I want people to try and understand it, and that's the impact, and I think that demonstrates the type of impact that badness can have. And even the way you described with Michelle's mother, how she would turn up at the police station every year with you know, a gift basket yeah. to put her face there so that they remembered. Yeah. It breaks your heart, doesn't mm. it? It was an eye-opener, not an eye-opener to me. I un- understood the pain of uh, families of victims of homicide, but seeing that, and yeah, she's a broken lady because of what someone did to her daughter. Gary, it might be the first time people are actually hearing her name, Michelle's yep. name. Yep. Why? Why don't we know her name more? There's another thing that has frustrated me during my career. Some victims, for whatever reason, get more attention than others. Michelle, she lived in a socially disadvantaged environment in the uh, suburb that she lived. She didn't have people that had a platform and she just fell between the gaps and it breaks my heart. And that's what Kathy would stay in contact with me just to have make sure that her daughter wasn't forgotten. And media play a part, but not just the media, society play a part in that mm. we give value to some victims and not to others. It's wrong. And uh, it certainly played out in the Barrable one, and I, because I've been involved in that for over 25 years, I can speak very strongly on that. That was because they were Aboriginal and people didn't identify with them. People didn't care. The media didn't think there was any interest in the story. And sadly, their matter got forgotten because of that as well. I know you worked on Barrowville or started working on Barrowville quite early on in your homicide detective yeah. career. Did working on that, seeing the racism they'd experienced, did it teach you something moving forward in the rest of the cases that you worked on? It opened my eyes up to so many things. It opened my eyes up to my unconscious bias mm-hmm. as well. Like I turned up there, I was a, a white cop going on to uh, the mission on the North Coast and I didn't think I was racist, but I made assumptions. It taught me so much that we just got to be careful. And I talk about it quite a lot, that unconscious bias. And uh, sadly, when these children disappeared, people assumed they just wandered off. In fact, the family were mortified when they were told, you know, oh, they've probably gone on walkabout, you know, a four-year-old girl, mm-hmm. Evelyn was four years old. It taught me the importance of sticking up and fighting for the victims. Now, I don't think the powerful journey that I had probably helped me stand in my own organisation because I kept arguing that we should continue on with the investigation and I was present with the families and community marching on Parliament four times and that, apparently that doesn't endear you, <laughs> endear you to, to an organisation. Yep. But when I look back, it was the right thing to do and I have absolutely no regrets and uh, when I got into trouble by the police, the families came down and supported me. They were on the steps of court. And people criticised me for getting too close to victims' families. Lazy people do that because it's not <laughs> – yeah, lazy people criticise because it's not easy managing families, but it's the right thing to do. And, and just, getting them to trust you. Just giving some humanity. Mm-hmm. And people go, oh, no, it gets too close to the victims. Bullshit. And there's also – a investigative reason to get close to the victim's families because you can keep an eye on the situation and you get more information. They trust you and you can keep an eye. You keep your suspects close. You might be looking at the family. But I just don't get it that people criticise me for the way I got uh, close to families. Do you think we're getting better at that unconscious bias thing? Obviously, Barraville was early 90s. Michelle's mm. murder was 2004. To me, it doesn't feel like we're getting any better. I, this is the thing I've learnt with Barraville, we'll use that as the example, is that when you took your foot off the pedal, it was forgotten again. Yeah. Like There was parliamentary inquiries and there was promises and I got respect for the parliament and what they did with the parliamentary inquiry. 
but nothing would happen unless they kept pushing and pushing and pushing. So, you know, we might take two steps forward, but we take one step back. Yeah. So we're slowly getting better, but I think we just need to learn from these mistakes. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. William Tyrrell, on the other hand, yep. I would hazard a guess that most Australians would know that name. Yep. For those that aren't aware, can you just give us a, a brief overview of what happened to William yep. in September 2014? William was three years old. He's quite often referred to as the little boy in the Spider-Man suit because of that iconic photo of him. That's the last photo we've got of him alive. He was uh, up visiting his foster grandmother's place with his uh, foster parents and he disappeared that morning. Hasn't been seen since. So you're now looking at almost eight years. My involvement in the investigation, five months after the investigation began, I was handed over the investigation to lead the investigation because the officer that was running it was retiring. And I ran it for four years and uh, that was the investigation that I got into trouble for, mm -hmm. for recording the conversation. That's a whole nother side issue. I'm not ashamed of what I did. I thought I, not thought, I had a reason that I was recording those uh, conversations. The courts have deemed... Not, but that's mm -hmm. a side issue. The fact is that Williams disappeared. After I left the police force, I resigned. I wasn't sacked. I resigned. After I left the police force, the only comment I made about William Tyrrell matter was that I wasn't allowed to do a handover, which I think was ridiculous. Four years, knowledge. I've been investigating homicides for 25 years. I had a lot of information I could have at least handed on, but uh, I wasn't afforded the opportunity to do that. Fast forward two years, there was a lot being released in the media about the investigation as a matter before the coroner, and I'm mindful of that. I got dragged back into it very publicly, November 2021. There was a search that they were doing in Benaroon Drive, that's where William disappeared from, and I got a lot of phone calls like that, like I'm identified with the William Tyrrell matter. And uh, I, like everyone else, hope they do get a breakthrough. Then uh, I got notified by a lot of people of you. How do you feel? That type of stuff. Yep. I'm thinking I'm feeling all right. I'm sitting at home. And uh, <laughs> then I found out that the uh, police commissioner had criticised the investigation I led for uh, four years, which is unprecedented. Mm. Uh, it's an active investigation. I was wondering what I would do, how I would respond, and uh, I sought advice from people, and you've got to say something. And so it dragged me back into it, and then I offered my comments on, uh, first of all, the commissioner criticising the investigation, I don't think was smart. The documents that were obtained in the New South Wales Police would support my position that there was no criticism of the way the investigation was done. So I'm not sure if he was misinformed by other people. I don't know why he decided to uh, come out and say that. But that dragged me back into the public arena. And uh, since that time, there's been some, I think, mischievous information released to the media and reported in the media about only having one suspect and the way yep. the search was done. And I couldn't stand by and not offer a comment on it. Mm. I've got all this knowledge and I'm not going to reveal you know, anything, uh, an active investigation. I'm mindful it's before the coroner, but breaking it down that the finger was pointed at a certain person and I felt obliged to at least make comments that balanced it out what yeah. I knew. And I can only talk for when I was in charge of the investigation and whether there was any evidence pointing to this person. And uh, I've got to say there wasn't any evidence. And this particular person was also a person that stood up publicly for myself. And this is where, because I get asked this question so often and I think I'll break it down this way. In all my time as a homicide detective, I've never had a killer complain that the investigation was being downgraded <laughs> or closed. Now, Yep. If you gave me one sentence to say, that's what's happened. And this person was publicly criticising the police that she was worried that the investigation was going to be shut down. I've never seen that in my career. The person you're talking about, there's a lot of AVOs, non-publication orders out. We're yeah. not allowed to really talk much about their involvement. Do you think sometimes that makes it worse? Because we've been given these tiny little bits of information, but we don't have a whole story, we don't have context, and you come to conclusions. Yeah, and the way information has been released to the media and the timing of it, I think it's something that does not sit well with me. Mm. I, I think someone's been crucified and we all should just take a step back because the amount of people that have 
said to me, I can say this hand on heart, I don't go through a day of my life without someone speaking to me about the Tyrrell Manor, Mm -hmm. which I accept that's part of the responsibility. But yeah, I don't like how this played out and this person's been charged with these offences and it becomes front page that... What I can say is that those charges have absolutely nothing to do with the abduction of a three-year-old boy seven years ago. Yeah. So I think the public need to, you know, take a step back. And also, you know, my calling out saying there should be a public inquiry about the William Tyrrell investigation, I can say to you, I wish I'd never had to mention this again. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even going to be in the book. I didn't want William in the book. Like, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing now. But I, I made that commitment to William's family a long time ago that I'd do everything humanly possible and I couldn't sit by and not offer an opinion or comment on it. So I think it's sad the way it's playing out. Calling for a public inquiry, I'd also like to point out it was almost 12 months ago that the uh, New South Wales Police Minister suggested on the back of the criticism about the investigation by the commissioner, that he would initiate an internal investigation about the matter. Now, it's all very well to have an internal investigation, but if I believe an external investigation would be more appropriate, and perhaps because of all the misinformation that's been passed out to the public, that it should be made public what's happened. Now, there's a double-edged sword to that. If I'm calling for a public inquiry, if I've done wrong, I'm going to be the one uh, one criticised. But it's too important when a three-year-old child has disappeared. Mm. And if we had made mistakes, those mistakes need to be identified to ensure they haven't happened again. But uh, I know the frustration of the family that this internal bickering, and you know, I'm part of it, but I feel that I've got to defend myself. But the focus should be on finding William. That's a sad thing. Well, while all this was playing out, the other thing that was happening was they did another search of the property. Yep. And that was also really publicised. And you talk about in your book how, you know, the way that the police were feeding to the media during that was even quite astounding. They didn't have to. No, I've never seen anything like it. And uh, I'm not in the business of criticising police that they're doing something. So good luck to them. I sincerely, hand on heart, say I hope they solve this crime. They need to. We should be judged if we don't. But I've never seen anything like it. Mm. I've never seen the media announcement that... I was watching. I thought it was only a matter of time that uh, someone was going to be charged. Me too. I thought it was imminent. And that is why I'm constantly being called about and spoken about it because imminent is the right word. And I think, yeah, that's how it played out. Then the search, and, uh, you know, I don't know the basis of why they were searching those areas, but I know we'd already searched those areas. But I'd never seen the media fed so much information of the search. Like, you remember that piece of red material that was found? Mm -hmm. And they're holding it up for the purpose of the media. I could look at it and say, that's not from the Spider-Man suit. (laughs) I I could tell straight away. Which was found to be true. Found to be true. Yeah, it was strange how it played out. For normal people sitting at home, they sit down and they watch the TV and they watch all of this play out and they, you know, you believe it, you take it on. How do Mm. you... You know, there's good cops, there's bad cops, there's good journalism, there's bad journalism. You've been in both worlds, no, we all know that. But how do we help people understand how to sift through that and what to actually take on? Yeah, I think, you know, in journalism, watch the headline. The headline can be very misleading. Read the story and get your sources from as many areas as possible. And also don't jump to conclusions. Mm. Like it's sensational, you know, the search, the dramatic search. Everyone thought there's going to be you know, an arrest and a breakthrough. I was looking at it with a little bit of suspicion and then when I saw them searching under the veranda, I've looked and gone, they're not going to find anything. We searched under the veranda before. Yeah. Like, to me, that told me a lot. But I'm prefacing all this with the fact I haven't been involved in the investigation for over three years, so I don't know what they're doing. Yeah. But you know, I got dragged into the commentary because – for whatever reason, they decide to criticise the investigation, which the irony of that is their own records will support the position I'm taking, that there was no criticism of the way I was running the investigation the whole time I ran the investigation. But the way it's played out, it's almost like someone's been served up to the uh, public as this is the person responsible. Mm -hmm. How do you undo that damage? And interestingly, after the search went for about three weeks, 
I didn't see any police do a stand up and answer questions, but you told us you were going to find something. There was just a media release that was handed out. So, yeah. And the damage done to that person that we were mentioning before, yeah. who is now just left to kind of deal with that. <laughs> yeah. And, and we've got to be careful. And I was criticised for going hard. You even asked the question, you know, yep. damage with investigations. There is a damage to be done, but it's got to be balanced to, you know. And a, also a, you'd already gone hard. Yeah. You talk about it in the book. You've gone hard on these particular people. Well, that was another reason that I had to come and, and speak out yeah. because they're going, look, oh, look, we've got a new suspect. Well, hold it. <laughs> this suspect was eliminated when it was handed over to me. Then we also looked at it again during the time mm. and eliminated. And, you know, I still remember doing a media stand-up with the commissioner of police, not the one that criticised, but the prior one, and the state premier answering questions that were all in agreement that these people are no longer suspects yeah. in the matter. So, And they get pulled back in. Yeah. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Bath. I'm speaking with former homicide detective Gary Jubelin. We were talking about it briefly before, but you were charged in the end for some involvement that you had in that case. It was for conversations that you recorded. Mm. And you were charged and then you were convicted by a judge. And in the book you talk about how angry that made you feel. You left the court and you just were like furious. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Did it help you to understand the, I'm going to use quote marks, other side a little bit more, what it's like to be in a defendant's shoes? Oh, Oh, most definitely. And that's, you know, and life is about learning. I realised what it's like to be at the end with the full power of the state coming after you. That's how I felt. And I, out of all people, probably set up the best to cope with that. I knew the system. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd been around long enough and the, the allegations of, against me weren't horrific. No. Like I recorded a conversation on my telephone. You know, big deal. Everyone knew that I'd done it. And there was listening devices in the place and all that, but I, I'm not going on, on to that. But the pressure I felt. Yeah, I won't say, yeah, I'm not going to show weakness. It never broke me. But <laughs> between, between you and me, it did almost break me. I just felt so just under attack everywhere I went. And uh, it gave me appreciation of the power of the court. And uh, it's also, you know, I hate saying this because I think the court system we've got is comparative like around the world. We've got it pretty good. There's mm. checks and balances in place that need be. But, yeah. I've lost my faith in courts to a degree. After that. In, in that uh, I was putting things across in my defence that just didn't seem to come across and uh, I sort of scratched my head and thought, what was all that about? But I was angry after that mm. and uh, potentially broken and I didn't want to, and it sounds I'm talking like this, I'm whipping myself up, it sounds like <laughs> I'm still angry. I have let it go. I had to let it go. and. Mm. People that I respect their opinions said, you can either let that destroy you or you can move on. That's what I've done. I'm really enjoying my career in the media and the Mm. stuff that I'm doing. I think it's all positive and that. And I said to you earlier on that I'd rather not ever have to mention William again, but I keep getting dragged back into it. And that's the price I pay for the job I did. Well, I guess the way you just said that, that's how, you know, certain people that are convicted of crimes feel they're constantly pulled back into something and if it's you know something that's not particularly bad or yeah it's constantly a mark on their name yeah and it made me think I was walking to court at Central with my son and I said I feel like I'm walking into a lynch mob like (laughs) it it, it felt that way it felt so oppressive walking in there and and we were saying imagine if you were charged with something serious like you're going a, down for a long time. A, a going, if you're walking in there for a serious offence or an offence, an allegation that uh, you're ashamed of or whatever, like I said right from the start, this is why I recorded the conversation. I'm not ashamed of that. But, yeah, it made me realise how oppressive the courts can be and fighting the system. So since leaving the police, I've sat down with so many people that have been on the wrong side of the law. Yep. And that's changed my view on quite a few things, as we discussed earlier on the impact that upbringing has. But I've also found people, and this is where my passion's sort of going now, and it sort of comes at the tail end of the book, but uh, Ken Marslew, whose son uh, Michael was uh, killed, an armed robbery. Michael was only 18 and he was working in a pizza hut, you know, paying his way through uni and he was shot. Just a horrific crime. 
and Ken, I, I've become very close friends with Ken, and uh, he had to channel that anger somewhere. And I made the mistake of saying once that he's got over the death of his son. And he said, I'll never get over the death of my son. And he pulled me in the line on it. He said, I'm still angry about it, but I decided to channel that anger somewhere positive. He's been doing such good work in prisons for a long time, going in, speaking to our prisoners, restorative justice about you know different ways of dealing with things. And Ken really impressed me, and he gave me the confidence to speak in public too. And uh, you know, I'll attribute this to uh, Ken because I was saying, look, I feel like I'm always putting myself up. I just want to crawl in a hole and you know, live, <laughs> live a quiet life. Yep. And he said, you've got the experience, you've got the life experience, you've got to be able to you know, pass that on and tell people what you're learning. And that's given me the confidence, like writing a second book, doing stuff like that. And I also met Shane Phillips, an Indigenous uh, leader around Redfern with his Clean Slate program. And I went along to some of their uh, boxing classes where young kids are coming in and pointing them in the right way. And there's a lot of other people that I've met, a few of them I've touched on in the book, the type of work they're doing. It was like a, a, you know, a revelation thing. <laughs> hey, you can fight crime a different way. Yeah. And that different way doesn't need a gun and a set of handcuffs. We can prevent crime or when crimes happen, steering people in the right direction so they don't come back, like recidivism and that type of thing. Preventing that. And all of a sudden, I found a passion that because uh, I don't like crime. <laughs> like I'm still a cop. I don't. I don't like crime, but you can fight it a different way. And a lot of it's prevention rather yep. than cure. And that's getting the kids. You know, Bernie. I put to Bernie. Had a conversation. I'd go see him in prison because he got sick, and uh, we had some really deep conversations. Like he knew he was going to die, and there was always a rush about Bernie. He wanted to get so much across, and I think he wanted me to tell his story. Part of it. And uh, he said, there's no point trying to fix me. Like, you know, his time is too late, but you've got to get in these young kids and help them out and, you know, steer them in the right direction. And that's re-energised me and thinking, okay, what I'm doing is something that's important and letting people understand that. I think what I found really interesting in reading about your friendship with Bernie and also getting to know a lot of these other convicted criminals that yeah. are now out some of them had been in prison for 30 years, 20 years, like big <laughs> yeah. crimes. And you talk about how comfortable they made you and how friendly they were, almost more so than when you were with some of your police colleagues. Well, How do you explain that? Like, you know, these it, guys are it, hardened it, criminals. It, it, it's been a, a very strange transformation. <laughs> and, uh, you yeah, know, John Killick, one of them, he, 34 years in prison, I think, or might have been longer, he escaped from Civil War, the prison in the helicopter. So yep. that's... I catch up with John a fair bit. <laughs> These are not still you know, active crooks trying to yeah. – they're going, look, we own what we've done, but what we've done is you know, wrong. We know that. But if we could teach people some lessons on where you could prevent it happening. Hanging out with the crooks or ex-crooks, and there's been some – you know, in the book, there's some interesting experiences that I've had – I don't compromise myself and they don't compromise their self. Like there's a code that they live by and a code that I live by. I would never, you know, help them out if they wanted advice on what would police do this way. And they're not going to tell me about crimes they've done or unsolved crimes or that. And I respect that. And I think they respect me for it. But, uh, you know, the thing that I was passionate about, policing was ripped away from me overnight. Mm. And I had to make a life for myself and, uh, you yeah, know, the police have made it very clear they don't want other police associating with me because um, <laughs> I'm a convicted criminal. Yeah, this horrendous. I, I think they want me to be Roger Rogerson. I just can't quite live up to the... Uh, well... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I fall a bit short. A little bit short. <laughs> I was actually at a book launch, uh, Russell uh, Manser, who uh, was again a uh, armed robber and uh, he's turned his life around. But when you hear about Russell's upbringing and what happened to him and how he was sexually assaulted in institutions where people that were supposed to be looking after him are committing this. And when we talk about badness, yep. that's where I'm going, well, who's worse? These people or, or Russell stealing cars or these people sexually abusing a, a young kid when they're in their care. But he had a book launch and uh, he asked me to speak at the book launch. And I got up and I'm looking out in the group and there was a lot of yeah, Russell's, let's call them associates mm -hmm. and all that. And the irony wasn't lost on me as an ex-cop up there talking there. So we we're having a bit of a laugh. But uh, I spoke to a, a few of the people and uh, they said, 
yeah, there's a little bit of respect there because I'm not taking sides. I'm just trying to let people tell their story like I let Russell tell their story. And that's where I think my role is now. Like Mm -hmm. I I do understand the world. I understand the cop side of it. I understand the crook side of it because I've been doing it so much. And uh, I think it's a good thing to sit down and speak to people from the opposite side because the old me or the old them would have been, you're a cop, piss off, or you're a crook, not talking well, you to prob- you. wouldn't have been allowed to no, in your capacity no. as a cop. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't associate with mm. them. But uh, I'm finding it interesting and I, I think, you know, if people learn, we can actually make a difference, you know, make a difference and uh, change the jail system that's so recidivism. It's, you know, the chances of someone going into jail, being released and coming straight back into a uh, jail... Yeah, we've got to change that. And that's not me being soft, but I think it carries some weight because of my career Yeah, that I'm allowed to say these things and people aren't going to just shout me down as a do-gooder. Although I did get called a social justice warrior, which You is, know what? That's not such a bad thing to I, be called. I, I, it, was, it was meant as a criticism and I've gone, oh, that's okay. Cheers, thanks. Yeah, I'll own that. For the last few years since leaving the cops, you've gone on this incredible journey of learning all of these things, talking to all these crooks, making all these friendships. Do you think it's given you a, a broader understanding of crime than your 34 years just looking at one side? Yeah, most definitely. It's opened my eyes up to um, looking at the broader picture and that I say that crime is not one-dimensional and mm. if you've been a police officer for too long, you start to look at it one-dimensionally, you become a bit cynical. Yeah, whatever, mate, you had a tough childhood. But now it's given me the ability to step back and look at it with a different perspective. And it definitely has changed my perspective. But uh, as I was saying, what I'm seeing is that we can fight crime, but we can fight crime in a different way. Mm. And uh, it's not touched on in the book, but I'm looking at how jails are set up. Now, the reality with jails, you want people to come out a better person than when they went in because they are going to come out. We put all these people in jail, but I can guarantee 99% of them will be released at some time. And you want them to come out as a better person with some social skills. Yeah. Bernie told the story, you know, when he was released from prison, the world was completely different and uh, he had no coping mechanism on how to deal with life outside. So, yeah, little things, not little things, big things like that, we can make a difference. I think people underestimate those things, like you were mentioning before, that Redfern program, yeah. the boxing program. The stats on that are incredible. Is it something like 73%? like in terms of down on crime in certain yeah, areas? Uh, the, Shane, when it was first introduced, he had a group of young males that were destined for a, a path that was going to take them to jail or some of them had already been in jail and everyone that signed up for this program turned their life around and uh, I find it amazing. I thought I was a crime fighter, but he's fighting crime more than me and making <laughs> a bigger impact. And that's so many people I've found like that. And I think I was wasting my time. That There's different ways of doing things. Well, it just goes to show that people can change. We, we like to think that they can't, but yeah. you can change their direction. You can change how they think. I love uh, stories of redemption. I really do. And I think that's important. And even in my own policing career, I had criminals I came across and uh, for whatever reason, They've turned their life around and, you know, some hard-ass crooks and now they're living a good life, paying their taxes, living like a citizen and raising their kids and the phone calls, instead of talking about crime, uh, I get a phone call and we're talking about how their kids are going. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or, or, you know, a former bikey that uh, my son wants to join the cops, what do you reckon, should I let him or stuff like that. So I, I'm just having a real interesting time in the people I'm meeting. Gary, I want to end here. Are you a better person for becoming a criminal? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've learnt my lesson. Um, I think I am. I like to think in my life I've evolved all the time. I'm definitely a better person than I was when I was an ignorant 19-year-old and yeah. you know, so many things. So life experiences change you. I'm probably more forgiving, uh, more understanding, and I, I think I'm, I'm a better person. And, you know, as a homicide detective, you've got to have this focus And no matter what you do, you're going to be criticised. And people don't understand that as a homicide detective, even when you've got all the evidence, you go to court, you're going to get criticised. And uh, you become resilient to that. But I'd like to think that uh, it's opened my eyes to a lot of things. I've met people I wouldn't have been able to meet if I was still in the cops. And I think there was a risk if I stayed in the cops, I would have just become angry because I was fighting a system that I didn't 100% believe in. I learnt from great people in the police and 
what they taught me about policing, some things had changed, and I didn't like what I was seeing the change, that we forgot what we're there for. We were public servants. But uh, I think most people would think I'm a better person because <laughs> I, I think, <laughs> yeah. Well, you're still fighting crime. You're still doing what you love. You're just doing it from a different angle. Yeah. And at, with more perspective. That's right. And I, I think, and I take it back to the conversation I had with Ken Marslew. He said, look, you've got a platform. You can offer an opinion and uh, maybe this is what you were meant to do. Thanks to Gary for joining us on today's episode. His new book, Badness, is available now at all good bookstores or you can find it through the link in our show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Madeline Joannou. The executive producer is Gia Moylan. <laughs>